should we decide uh, whether some being is alive or dead? How does one, one actually define life? There have been and are really two quite different approaches to that question, um, which I'll call the metabolic and, and the genetic. Um, the metabolic approach is to say that a living organism has some kind of fixed form and structure. It may change gradually, but it has a, a form. Uh, but all the, its components, all the atoms and molecules that compose it, are coming in from the outside, are being changed, and are leaving. So it, it's, it's a constant structure with a continuous flux of material through it, requiring energy for its maintenance. It's the kind of thing, I nearly said the kind of nonsense, uh, that biochemists are liable to say. <laughs> it, 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 it has, if you think about it, to be, to be nonsense. If it were true, uh, that flame would be alive. The flame has a clear structure, with a blue center and a mauve surround, Yet every atom is only part of it for a fraction of a second, I guess. You may say, well, it isn't alive because if you turned the gas off, it would, it would stop. But let's face it, if that would, I could say you're not alive because I depri if I deprived you of food and oxygen, you would go out. Um, the fact that, that, that it's, it's being fed by gas uh, proves nothing. It has another property of life, if you think about it. It reproduces that Bunsen burner was lit by a match, by another fire. We could, though I promise I won't, uh, use it to set light to something else on the bench here. Um, I mean, in other words, fire reproduces, it has all the metabolic properties of life, and yet, clearly, in some sense, it's not alive. What is it that it is missing? Um, the other view, uh, which I, I, I would call the geneticist view, um, is that that flame was not alive because it lacks heredity. It lacks the property that like begets like. And that, in fact, the essential properties of living things um, are that they have three properties. Multiplication, which the fire has, that one will give rise to two, two will give rise to three. It has variation. Well, flames have variation. I mean, they can be a house on fire or a Bunsen burner, which have very different forms. Um, but it must also have heredity, um, and that is what the flower does not have. Uh, and I've defined, described heredity in this, in this slide. There must, be very, there must be multiplication. An A must divide and give rise to two offspring. A B must divide and give rise to two offspring. But when multiplication takes place, A's must give rise to A's and B's must give rise to B's. Just occasionally, perhaps, a mistake happens, and an A gives rise not to an A, as it said to speak, ought, but gives rise to a C. But if it does, then the C will, as we say, breed true, will give rise to C's. It, that is the property of heredity, and it's the property that the flame lacks. The nature of that flame does not depend upon whether it was lit by a match or by a cigarette lighter or by another Bunsen burner its parent doesn't affect its nature. Its nature is entirely determined by the immediate environment and not by its history. Um, why do I hark on like this about heredity? Why does it matter? It matters essentially for the following reason, that if you have entities which have these three properties, multiplication, variation, and heredity, then quite necessarily you will have evolution by natural selection, and you, you, you get everything else, in a sense, for free. Um, I mean, what we really want to understand are, are not the molecules I'll be talking about later on, but we want to understand primroses and elephants and people and fruit bats and things. We want to understand really complicated objects. But in a sense, that's not a difficulty. Once we've got natural selection, the rest follows, and you can't have natural selection without heredity. So, that's why... This talk is really, although I've called it the origin of life, it's actually going to be about the origin of heredity because that's what the hard thing to explain is. The question is where to start. And I, I want to start by the notion of crystallization, though I don't think crystallization is heredity for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Uh, what we have here is a, a, a um, solution, a supersaturated solution, which has no crystalline structure, it's just a pure liquid, but when Bryson adds a crystal to it, 
as a sort of seed. With any luck, it will crystallize, and indeed it is. It's gradually, the crystal is growing, new crystals are appearing, and give it another few seconds, and that solution will have crystallized. Um, in that sense, it's rather like a file, um, that when, when you give it, you can light it in a sense, but this time you light it with a crystal, more crystals will grow, and when it's crystallized, we could then use one of the crystals from there to seed another test tube of supersaturated solution, and that will crystallize, and so on. Um, but as yet, there's no heredity. Now, how does crystallization work? Um, well, um, it will become obvious to you as this talk goes on that I am not a chemist. I do not understand chemistry. Uh, somehow or other, they failed to teach me any chemistry when I was a boy, and I've never quite caught up on it. But nevertheless, the principle is, is like this. Um, I hope. <laughs> um, you have in the solution some objects which I call monomers so, uh, molecules and they have um, bumps and holes on them holes like that and bumps like that and the rules that I've made up for this particular crystal is that two of these mono monomers will not stick together unless at least two of the little pegs can, of one of them can stick into at least two holes. It can, then it'll stay together, but one bond, as we call it, isn't enough. And if you look at them, there's just no way two of them can join together uh, with that property. In order to get the thing to crystallize, you have to put in a seed like this, which you've put together in some way, or which maybe happened by you know, the really rather rare chance event that sometimes happens in the world. You get a seed. Once we've got that, there is some, there's a slot there that one of these can fit into, uh, forming something. Here he is fitted in. Once he's fitted in, there's a slot here that that one can fit into, and then this one, and then that one, and the thing will go on growing. And if we added another rule that when it got to a certain size, it's likely to break in half, then we have got reproduction. We've got an object which replicates. But it isn't actually heredity because there's only one kind of object you can have. There's no variation. And you can't have heredity without variation. If there's only one kind of thing, you can't say that like begets like in any meaningful sense. But it turns out that you really can make a very simple modification to that kind of scheme, and you've got heredity. Um, and there it is. <coughs> I've now got two kinds of units, which are colored different, <laughs> called A and B. They happen to be mirror images of one another, but that's not logically necessary. And they, too, will not crystallize on their own. To get them to crystallize and form a polymer, you have to put in a seed. But now there are two kinds of seed you can make, both containing two Bs and an A in this case, but fitted together in different ways. If we seed the solution with one of those, it'll build a polymer like that. And if it breaks and you've got two polymers like that and they'll build more, if we seed it with that, it'll make a polymer like this. Um, so we now actually have not only reproduction and variation, because there are two kinds of seed, two kinds of polymers, but we have heredity, like that gets like. However, we're not quite home yet, as far as the origin of life is concerned or as far as living things are concerned. Because although we've got multiplication, variation, and heredity, we've got what I would like to call limited heredity. In this case, very limited heredity. There's only two kinds of things we can have. Although the two kinds of things breed true, that's no good for evolution. For evolution, we need an indefinitely large number of different kinds of things, each one of which will breed true. Until we have that, we really can't get the evolution of what is in this room or evolution of the primroses or any interesting organism at all. So how are we to achieve not limited heredity with just a few different kinds of things, but unlimited heredity with an indefinite number of kinds of things? The answer to that question in theory, I think, was, was first suggested by a physicist, a very distinguished physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, just more than 50 years ago, who suggested that you could achieve unlimited heredity if you had what he called an aperiodic crystal. Now, I'm not going to try to explain to you exactly what he meant by 
a periodic crystal because I can, in a sense, do something easier than that by telling me that actually he was right uh, and that we now know what <laughs> a periodic crystal is uh, that upon which all life depends and we know how it replicates. <laughs>